Hi, and welcome. I'm Amanda, and I'm at Battleground Games and Hobbies in Abington, Massachusetts. Battleground is a game and hobby store in the greater Boston area with three locations. There's one here in Abington, where I am, because it's where our streaming rig is. Makes sense, because I'm streaming. And then there's another location down south in Norton, and another one up north in Saugus on Route 1. And uh, like I said, this is where our streaming rig is. It's also close to where I live, so this is where I am. I'm going to be doing some painting today. I paint uh, alternate Fridays and Saturdays, so like next week I'll probably be painting on a Saturday. Um, but today we are going to continue work on the figures from the Highlander board game put out by River Horse. This is a, uh, a game where you get to play an immortal from the one and only movie. They never made any others. And um, you get to fight the other players and duke it out so that you'll be the only one left at the end of the gathering. And the base game comes with seven figures. It comes with um, Connor McLeod of the Clan McLeod and his tartan and weird ratty cloak with the McLeod Claymore. It comes with Ramirez, the Spanish peacock, who is actually Egyptian, but played by Sean Connery, because why not? Um, wearing his peacock feather cloak, which is legitimately lined with blue satin. I looked at so many reference photos. Um, you know, because why, why not that either? Um, so yeah, they're done. It comes with the Kurgan and his bronze skull armor. It comes with a character you only see for a few moments, right at the beginning of the movie, Iman Fasil, otherwise known as the dude who loses his head in the garage. The board game has backstory in the instruction booklet for each of the characters in the game, which is really cool because <clears throat> it's not like the movie gives you a ton of backstory for anyone but basically Connor. Um, he's the only one you really get a whole lot of backstory for. And even his backstory, like you get like a moment here and a moment there and then that's it. Um, you don't know who this guy is. You don't know what his deal is. Why is he this blonde guy? His name is Iman Fasil. Why, why is he so white? Um, but with that name, what, what's up with him? Um, you don't really know much about Ramirez other than the fact that he's supposedly Egyptian, but was also the chief metallurgist to the King of Spain. Um, you don't really get background for the Kurgan. You know he was like a raider and stuff. Um, you get backstory. The game wrote up backstory for each of the characters, which is really neat because the expansion, the Princes of the Universe expansion, has either earlier or later time period uh, versions of those characters. So this is uh, Ikamu Sek. This is the earlier version of Ramirez. This is my copy that I'm showing off of the expansion. The copy that I'm painting today belongs to a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, my friend Sarah. Sarah um, and I are met because of Highlander, uh, because we were both fans. So I bought her a copy of the game when they kickstarted it, and I promised I would paint it for her. So yeah, you get earlier versions of characters, or you get modern day versions of the characters. So here's Connor as Russell Nash, looking oh so very late 80s with his white sneakers and his acid, acid wash jeans. Um, you also get modern day Kurgan, which is really neat, and Crusader Iman Fasil who has covered up his shield. Why did he do that? Because he abandoned the Crusaders when he realized that Muslims were people. Weird, right? Um, 
he's still I don't love him as a character he's very much got this like I am the the new messiah sort of complex going on um, but he sort of early in his life realized that while he still believed that he had a holy purpose and that his holy purpose was to win the game and like rule all of humanity uh, for the good of humanity that what he had been taught about what he believed as you know a young man which was that his way was the only way was not in fact true and therefore he turned away from that and um, took the name of a man who helped him who eventually died so the game has all of those characters and then it has one more character that is from the movie and that is Sunda Castagir. This is my copy of Castagir. I'm not 100% thrilled with his jacket. His jacket's a real pain in the butt, let me be frank. Um, also, I cannot monitor chat easily today, so hopefully no one's trying to talk to me. Um, Andy, I guess, might be able to hang out and chat. I left my laptop at home. So all I have is my phone, and my phone... <sighs> Twitch works on my phone. I just don't like the mobile um, app for Twitch. I find it really difficult to monitor chat in the mobile app. Um, I, I don't find it hard to watch a stream in mobile, but I find the chat really difficult to deal with in mobile, so I, I, I'm not gonna. Um, but it does mean that I can show you. This is what Castagir's supposed to look like. This is what he's wearing, is this sort of orange and purple robe thing. Um, you can see it a little closer here, a little better detail. There are some shots of him from the back. You can actually see this is actually like a patterned stripe. And there are wider versions of the stripes that come from like here and go down the back, um, which is why my copy of it, he has those wider white stripes. The problem is orange and purple, when you start to sort of mix them together, orange and purple do not blend very well into anything other than mud. Um, let's see. There you can sort of see the... They're like almost ribbons. Um, orange and purple don't meld very, very well together because once you get orange and purple together, you have red, yellow, and blue all together and mixed up. So you actually get a very yellowy brown or very reddish brown. Um, and it just looks muddy. And that's not what I want. I don't want him to look muddy. I want him to look good because he should look good because he's castic here and he's awesome. Um, so I want him to look... Oh yeah, there, there's a... You can really see the... The movement, it's a very thin fabric. Wow, it's actually got this broad white stripe to it that I hadn't realized. Finding a full body shot of him is impossible. Oh, that makes me really both unhappy and happy at the same time. One, I'm glad I found this. Thank you to whoever put this gif up on Tumblr. Um, but also really sad because my copy of the figure is not great. That's not what I wanted to do. Back. Um, my copy of the figure is not, it doesn't look like that. Hum. Hmm. 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 I may have to. So I was actually thinking it might be a good idea to um for me to like actually repaint my copy of the figure <sighs> which is a giant pain because i already sealed it and everything oh wow yeah that really is it's like a big broad white stripe in the fabric well well then one i'm really happy i did this with Sarah's copy, which is that I, um, let me see if I can get it to not blow out the camera so much. Um, I base coated it in off white, I base coated it in ivory. Cool, 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 cool. Um, 
I may actually then um, hmm I think I am gonna repaint mine cool because mine I based in the purple but I really think that the off-white is going to be a better way to go. Um, so we're going to work on him today. He's our, our main objective. The other thing we're going to do today is finish up some detail work on two of the other characters. And these characters, excuse me, were original characters created for the board game. And that is Talia. Uh, she is a gun runner. She's Mesoamerican. She was originally Aztec. This is her earlier version, holding up a conquistador helmet because she likes to chop their heads off. And good for her. I really like that about her. Um, I actually really love her headdress in this. Um, I looked up traditional like dance headdresses um, for like modern Aztecs because it's not like the people totally disappeared. The, the civilizations may have like fallen in that the people who lived in those pla the places that we know of don't live there now. But it's not like the people just disappeared. They didn't all die. They're just native to that area and they're still around, um, which is cool. Um, but you know, the conquistadors brought a lot of, the conquistadors and colonizers brought a lot of diseases that the people in uh, the Americas and this continent were not immune to and didn't have any resistance to. Um, and they were also, you know, murdering bastards. So there was a lot of death. Um, Talia's story is that her people were being slaughtered by the conquistadors and her um, people asked for a sacrifice to appease the gods in hopes that it would save them. And she volunteered. She said, I will do that. You know, I'm the daughter of the like priest or whatever. Um, so I'll make a good sacrifice. And they stabbed her in the chest and then she revived. Because she's immortal. And that's how immortals happen. Um, is that if you have the potential to be immortal and you die a, a violent death, you will revive now fully immortal. So she came back and that was taken as a bad sign. When the gods reject her, your sacrifice, that's probably bad. Um, and so she and her father had to flee and she was like, well, fine, then I'm just gonna chop off as many heads of these murdering jerks as I can. So that's what she did. And like I said, good for her. She has this amazing weapon, this Makuahuitl. It's a real Mesoamerican weapon. It's basically a, the size and shape of a cricket bat and made of wood, but with chips of obsidian wedged into the edges. So uh, nice and sharp, because that's volcanic glass for anyone who doesn't know obsidian. So that's her. Um, and in her modern life, she's basically like, fine, you're going to mess around down here. Um, I'm going to mess back. I'm going to give my people weapons and uh, tough for everyone else. Excuse me. Um, so you get her modern version in the base game. And so I got to paint camo, which is always super fun. Love painting camo. It's one of my favorite things. I love it because it seems so chaotic. And when you start doing it, it feels like, oh, this is going to look muddy and messy. And no, this is going to be too obvious. And then um, as you add more colors and sort of keep going, you end up with See, mine is, this is my copy, it's a little more defined, hers is a little more, a little more muddied, um, but that was actually on purpose. I wanted hers to be a little bit more um, subtle, but they're for the most part very similar. Um, so I need to finish doing like her eyes and add some detail work to her bandana, otherwise she's pretty much done. Um, Maybe a little depth to the maquahuitl, a little bit more. 
Um, and then Castagir. And the other character is a uh, Namanaga Minamoto. She is also known as the Grey Ghost. She's a Japanese noblewoman. And she and her teacher uh, traveled around righting wrongs and helping the helpless. And she was known as the Grey Ghost. He was the Red Ronin. And when he lost his head, she decided to just remove herself from the game for a very long time. Until modern day, when she shows back up as Amy Gray. The only thing I don't love about this character, about this, this figure, is that her heels are molded in. I'm just like, oh, come on, man. Like, I could fight in heels, but I'd rather not. Um, so, my version of this character looks very different. That's my copy. And I painted her originally, and I was like, oh, I'm going to find, like, a traditional kimono, and I'm going to find something that I really like. And I found one, and I was like, ooh, that's really pretty. And it was this beautiful red and black kimono with these pink and gold flowers, pink and red and gold flowers, um, that sort of hide the border between the red and the black. They sort of disguise the, the hard line of it. And it had a gold obi, and it had this beautiful sort of uh, texturing to it. And I loved it, and I was like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. So I painted this red, and then I did the black, and then I, I went through with my tiny, teeny tiny little brushes, my teeny tiny little brushes, and did the flowers. And I'm really proud of it. But then I like thought back, and I was like, she's the gray ghost. Why did I put her in red? <laughs> It just happened to be the first like traditional as opposed to costume kimono that I found that I really liked the pattern of um, that I thought looked um, fancy enough because there are plenty of like kimono-like garments you can find that are meant for more casual wear but she's obviously she's got her hair you know she's got the wig on she's got her hair up she's got all the stuff um, and she looks like she's been made up to be in high society, but she's pulling a dagger out of her sleeve. So she's about to, she's about to shank someone, um, but she's sort of been hiding in plain view. So I wanted her, it to be a fancier kimono. I didn't want it to be more casual. And it was just the first nice one that I found that I really liked the look of and thought that I could replicate in paint. So this time I texted my friend Sarah and said, what do you think if I pick a different kimono? She said, go for it. So I went and found, and I can, I can bring this up on my phone, because I went and found it so that I could post it to the Twitters. Um, I found this really gorgeous um, kimono, because I specifically looked for gray kimonos. And this is what I found. And it's absolutely beautiful. It's black, but you can see it has this ombre effect here. It's black and then there's white here. And then it has this ombre effect going on. So it fades from the black into the white. It has these white willow leaves. And if you look really closely, you can see some of the leaves are actually like done in like coppery gold thread. Um, the obi is very detailed. It's this beautiful embroidered cloth um, that has almost a, a lavender sort of cast to it and silver. Um, more detail on the obi. Look at that. Just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and you can sort of see But there's silver bordering. I don't know if you can make it out on camera if I'm, I'm too blown out on the white. Um, but you can see there's actually a silver border to these. 
Um, so, and you can see sort of the fade here. There. So what I did was I did a wet brushing technique where I painted it black here and then I wet brush mixed. So I blended the paint on the figure to go into a lighter fabric. She's not quite a big enough figure and there's not as much visible from like the chest up to really showcase that white, the bright white. So I didn't go quite that far. You can see I did do some gold leaves. I did do the pale gold obi with the purple, um, the willow leaves. And then the obi in the back, I did um, a little bit of lavender to it, some lavender sort of leaves coming down. And then I dry brushed uh, bright silver over that and a little bit of silver highlighting on the fabric itself. So the last thing left to do on her is some touch-up work and her sandals, uh, which you can only really see one of. So, um, so we're going to do that. We're going to do touch-up work on her, touch-up work on her. And then we're going to work on Castigar. We're actually going to work on Castigar first and then let things dry on him before we go back at it. And I am, before I do anything else, and I'm annoyed because I already sealed mine, so I'll have to reseal it. But uh, that's fine. It's cool. It's cool. Everything's fine. Everything's good. Because he's going to look better. He's going to look better in the long run. So it's cool. Um, I actually, so I have two paint colors that I hate to use. One is yellow, any yellow. Yellows are horrible. Um, and I think it's just the fact that yellow pigment in general is just annoying to work with. And I say that because um, you might notice I, I do my nails. I, I try to keep them nice. This has been on for a week, so it's starting to chip in places, but... Um, I do my nails and I have a wide variety of nail polish colors and uh, one of the nail polish colors that is the most annoying to use is um, uh, yellow. It's just always streaky, it never goes on nicely, it's always weird and annoying. So, yellow. So I hate using yellow paint. I find yellow paint to just be the worst. Um, it's good for highlighting, but not much else. Um, Off-white. And I think it's largely that the off-white that I'm using is difficult. Um, I'm, I use uh, the Reaper colors, the Reaper Master Series paint. Because I am using paints belong to a friend who lets me, kindly lets me use them. Um, but the off-white in this set just isn't great. It's not, it's not great. Oh, this is like painful to paint over because I spent so long on it. It's fine though. It's not like I'm repainting the entire figure. Just the cloak. I don't know if like this jacket-y thing has another name. Like, not something that I, I'm familiar with as maybe a traditional garment or a non-traditional garment that has a name. It's just this, like, flowy jacket. Flowy over robe. The reason I don't like the off-white is that as it gets, like, starts to dry on the palette, like, as I use up some of it, uh, it gets weirdly gritty. None of the other paints in this box do that. So, so I feel it's definitely the off-white specifically. It's not like the age of the paint. I think it's just the off-white does that. I'm not going to worry too much about getting like all in up in his business. Um, 
largely because he's, I'm going to end up using the same colors. So if there's a little bit of purple here and there and a little bit of orange here and there on the edges, it's not the end of the world. I'm not even going to worry too much about getting it super opaque. Mostly what I want to do is work on a, a cleaner surface. Yeah, like I tried it with like orange as a base, and then I tried just like going on over the um, primer. Yeah, it, none of it worked. But I think the off-white is the way to go. Especially now knowing that there's this big wide stripe. The funny thing is I had said right from the start, I was like, man, I can't find any full body shots of Castigar. All I can see is him from like the shoulders up or like from like the chest, mid chest up. Ugh, annoying, right? So I was like, well, it's fine. It looks like it's the whole thing. But I was like, maybe I should just pull out my copy of the movie, get out my optical drive, and like take some, like take my own screenshots. Should have done it. Should have listened to my gut. It would have given me. I would have known earlier that that stripe was there. That like huge wide band. I would have known it was there. I would have been able to to run with it then. Oh well. A little frustrated with myself for not doing it. I keep looking over to my left because that's where my laptop usually is. I'm feeling really bad. It's not there. I can't look and see if anyone's talking to me. I would assume if anyone was talking to me, Andy would let me know. I assume he's watching. If you are, hi Andy. You're just downstairs. It's a good thing I was already going to go home later. So we have a cat that needs to be fed before our 7.30 p.m. stream where we will be playing some, some of the magics. We will be playing magical cards. Um, today is the pre-release for Throne of Eldraine, which is the newest Mavic Magic the Gathering set. It has a fairy tales and our Thurian legend theme to it, uh, sort of feel to everything. Uh, so Andy and I made gingerbread cookies because there is a gingerbread man card called Ginger Brute uh, in the game. We will not be playing Throne of Eldraine though tonight. We are going to be playing janky kitchen table magic tonight. Normally Friday nights we play... Um, a variety of board games. We usually try to play something we've never played before or that like only one of us has played before. We play with our buddy John um, and we, we have a, a lot of fun. We played uh, last week, I think we played last Friday. No, that was the week before. <coughs> last week we played Spell Smashers. Um, Spell Smashers was a ton of fun. It's like this deck not even deck building it's card based spelling fun where the words that you spell then dictate the like damage that you do to a boss it's hard to explain but it was it was a ton of fun to play it was really good it was a good time um we played last friday the week before because that was friday the third And that was a lot of fun too. That was a really good time. Um, 
we we played uh, we actually got through several rounds of it so last Friday is a board game where um, you are playing the cast or the, the characters in a horror movie like a slasher horror movie and it's asymmetric play you have the um, the murderer, you have the, the axe murderer, um, who has a hidden, they have a, like a screen and they have little, little hidden movement stuff. Um, and then you have the characters. Aww, hi Jules. Thank you for texting me and letting me know. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. You are cozied up at home with a heat pad and a blanket. I am so glad. I hope you're feeling better than you were last night, at least. It really stinks. Jules, or my friend Jules, uh, who is Insidious Pie in the chat, was not feeling well last night, so I'm hoping she is feeling better. Um, but yeah, um, you play as the cast and you're, the first round is you are the characters. The slasher is chasing you around. You don't know where they are. They reveal their movements where they were three turns ago, you know, every three turns. And um, your goal as the campers is to, it's, it takes place at a summer camp because of course it does, is to um, search around the camp, find the keys to the various cabins and then get into the cabins and reinforce the doors and windows. Um, the murderer can actually chop open the cabins and ruin them, basically make them unfortifiable. Um, there are, there's only space for two people in each cabin, so once a cabin is full, there, there are five campers, so you kind of have to just run with it. Um, and you can find dead bodies and all sorts of stuff like that. And uh, it's a really fun game. It's very silly, but it's a ton of fun. And then the second round, the campers have been like, okay, all right, it's, it's morning, we gotta find this guy. So now it's the campers who are trying to find the murderer and they're chasing him around. Um, by the end of that round, they've probably done something. Um, if any of the campers die, you lose that camper, but then another camper that it would be the same color token sh arrives the next round um, and shows up. Um, you're basically trying to kill the, um, the murderer. If you manage to actually kill him, uh, like uh, you find him and attack him, um, then the person who did that becomes the chosen one. And then the next round the murderer is trying to go after the chosen one specifically. My God, this paint, I've been, I shook this paint before we started. There we go, there we go, much better. Um, he's trying to find the chosen one in the next round and kill the chosen one. And everyone else's job is to just get between the chosen one and the murderer and sacrifice themselves. Um, and I don't remember what the last round is, but um, it, it involves the chosen one then having to like enact, you know, whatever is going to stop the murderer. It's ridiculous. It's a very silly game, but it, it mimics this like feeling of there being um, different rounds. Ooh! the iPad is working. Hey Andy, the iPad has 11% charge. This is great. Oh, except it needs a passcode. Can you text me the passcode for this? <laughs> that would be great. Um, yes, you do, Jules. You have an art stream to watch. I am here. I'm going to paint tiny lines. So what I discovered, I don't know if you were watching when I discovered that um, Castagir, his outfit actually has, this is him hugging Connor, his outfit actually has this big wide white stripe down at the bottom. 
which I didn't know. Um, so I have to thank uh, whoever it was who put this great um, GIF up on, on the tumbles. Look at this. Because whoever did um, gave me a really great shot of the like full robe, which is awesome. Super cool. Um, so now I know that I need to make sure I leave a broad white band around the bottom. So yeah, that's really cool. So we're going to start uh, doing the stripes. Mm, which brush do I want to use? I don't know if Andy heard me ask for the passcode or there's, ah, there it goes, okay. I see it, I see it. Yay, that worked. Thank you, Andy. Cool, um, so I'm going to I'm going to set it so that it doesn't go to sleep right away. And then I'm going to um, Awesome, cool, no auto lock, nice. Okay, and now I'm going to find that picture of Castigar and put it on the iPad and just like put it up for myself so that I, I can see it. Stop auto-playing. Uh, Auto-play gifts are like just the bane of my existence. I guess I, I can't. So annoying. You know, the official like figure for Namanaga Minamoto is not nearly as interesting looking as mine. Well, I mean, it was from the Kickstarter, so they didn't have it finished. I think mine's prettier. <laughs> I did detail work. All right, you know what? I actually do want a still because I want to be able to look really closely at. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We're just going to set that right there. Are you ready to watch me spend like ages painting very, very tiny lines on things? Guess what? This is the stream for you.
So Pi, I think you'll be happy to know that um, the cat is still disgustingly cute. She was very cute at us this morning. I gotta check my text and see what you just said. <laughs> Every time you see that cat's picture, you feel an overwhelming urge to rub your face on her tummy. Same. In person, it's even harder to resist. Only knowing that she would be like, play time! And that I would then have paws on my head with claws. Um, are, that's the only thing that keeps me from like just hugging her and snuggling her. You lying. Okay, it's about, it's like right below where his belt would be, is where the, so like, right about there, I think, worth it, probably, she let me rub her belly this morning, it was very exciting. I, I almost, I didn't take advantage, like I didn't take real advantage of it, but man, was it so, uh, tempting. So it goes from there to about mid thigh.
I'm actually going to go in and use a darker purple in a couple of places because he does have a lot of different shades going on and the white sort of peeks through. And then we're going to have to do the verticals. Maybe I'll end up doing like a purple wash in places to hit the crevices.
I'm like drifting off off screen. That looks a lot more like what I wanted. Yeah. I think we're going to keep doing the horizontal lines and then let them really dry before we go messing with the other. Messing with the verticals. I also think the addition of the mahogany and darker purple is probably a good idea every little bit. I don't want it to be over present. I do think they add to it.
Whoa. Ten. Ten, ten. Yes, I can hear you.
All right, we're going to let him sit for a bit now that his uh, stripes are done. Well, his horizontals anyway. And then uh, we'll get working on the verticals to make it all look more like that. While he's drying, we will work on um, Talia and Namnaga. So what Talia needs is uh, some work on her eyes. And we're actually going to get some black down to do her like eyebrows. This is my tiniest brush. There we go. She looks good. I'm happy with her. Here we go. I'll go back over and touch that up with white. It's 
So this is my copy that I'm redoing. It doesn't have to match exactly. It's not going to. So the molding of it actually doesn't, it, it does, but it also doesn't follow the exact pattern of the coat. So the way I'm seeing in the GIF, the coat is actually if you took just a flat panel of fabric and split it for the neck. So let's recreate it with a paper towel. So, okay, you have that, right? Like a poncho almost. Except it's then been gathered at the shoulders to a point. It's like got a gather here and it has a gather here at the shoulders like that. And then it's been looped under, almost. The sleeves sort of have a billow to them. It's a really interesting design. I would love to actually see more of it. Like, I would love to see more of how it's constructed. I am going to have to, I'm going to have to look at the movie again and look at it. Oh, man, I wish like I wish I could just find a picture of just the costume by itself. Yeah, the sleeve is actually it's got a lot more billow to it than is clear in the picture. Oh, what an interesting garment. I, uh, I wish I could, I wish I could see more of it. Because see, the problem is if I knew if it had like a proper name, I could look it up by name and find like pictures of other versions of the same thing, which I could then use to extrapolate out what this version should look like. Unfortunately, I don't know what it's called, if it even has like a name, like in his earlier lifetime, figure. He's wearing a specific type of coat, and I've now forgotten what the type of coat it was is, but I was able to look at the time period of the photo and know that it was like he was in Europe at the time, and the style of his hair in the figure <coughs> places him in like Edwardian time period, maybe. Um, So Edwardian time period in Europe wearing a specific type of 
fancy coat. Um, and I was able to look up clothing from that period in Europe. But this doesn't feel like it's like specific to the 80s necessarily. And it's probably something vaguely African, but where in Africa, I don't know. Africa's really big. There are a lot of different cultures. Um, it's not like it's one monoculture and styles of dress and popularity of like newer versions, like updated versions of things differ from place to place. And I think Castigar is supposed to be like Moroccan or something. I don't know. I'm just annoyed that I don't know what it is and therefore can't find it easily because it's not as specific to a historical period. And it's not something that I know enough about that I can recognize the, um, the culture that it's from to look at like how other versions of it were made. Like for, okay, for example, Iman Fasil is really interesting from a uh, clothing perspective because he's very obviously carrying a crusader shield and he's wearing a tabard that looks like a crusader tabard, right? Except this helmet is not a helmet that the crusaders really wore. These pants do not look like what the crusaders wore. He has some chainmail. That's accurate, but everything else looks more, um, uh, crud, what's the name for them? There's a specific name and now I'm blanking. Um, but looks more like the people that they were fighting because he abandoned the crusaders. So that was a really interesting thing to, to look up was to realize, oh, this doesn't look like crusader armor. Let's look up what types of clothing um, were being worn in the area that he was in at the time that this figure is supposed to be from. And then I was able to find examples of that helmet, examples of those pants and be like, oh, oh, cool. All right. Yeah. And he's got a scarf around his waist. That's unusual. What colors would that be seen in? Um, and that was really interesting to look up. But I was able to look that up via the context of knowing that he was a crusader and that um, his backstory gives him sort of this, a, a time and a place. Castigar in modern day doesn't really give me much of a time and a place other than New York in the 80s. That doesn't help me. <laughs> that helps me not at all. If I looked up fashion New York 80s, even if I look up like African American fashion New York 80s, I doubt I would find this. Uh, maybe I would, but um, it seems unlikely because that uh, there's a, a breadth of fashion going on there. Well, let's take a look. Let's see. Yeah, not, not helpful. It's just too, too broad. There was a lot going on and there was a lot of variety and variation. And you get the impression that like Castigar was definitely dressing not in like 80s fashion. There's a lot of really bad 80s fashion. Yeah, I, I don't know. It just, it bothers me. It's definitely a hole in my knowledge of clothing and costuming that I can't immediately place it. And a lot of movies, you know, have people who've done like deep dives on the costumes and stuff, uh, especially when they're period pieces. There, there have been deep dives on a lot of costuming things. Um, this is not one of those. Highlander has not had anyone, um, at least not in any venue that I, I've been privy to, do a really deep dive into its costuming. 
um, to the point where you can like look it up and find some in-depth discussion of the costuming choices made and um, it's not like Lord of the Rings where you're getting someone like talking about why they chose the fabric they chose even though it never sh like shows up on in detail on screen. Instead it'd be like, yeah, we found this in a secondhand store. We put Connor in a leather jacket because, um, well, we had a leather jacket. We put skulls on the Kurgan because we wanted him to look badass. <laughs> like, <laughs> what decision making? Like, maybe there was a lot more thought to it, but no one has actually, like, put that out there. Not that I've, I've ever seen. The fabric itself isn't the issue, it's the construction of the jacket that I, I would love to see clearer. Oh, maybe the actor who played him is out there on social media somewhere. I could ask him. What do you remember about the coat you wore when you played Castigar?
run a ball green field on uh, the arena yet? You have to spend money to do that. Yeah. You can only take them, so I see. Yeah. There's so much fine work, I find myself just very focused on it instead of like talking. So I'm sorry, I'm so quiet. I'm glad I'm redoing my version of him. I think it's going to look better. I was never entirely satisfied with how he looked. So redoing him is a chance to make things right, as it were.
I'm going to have to touch up with the off-white later.
I feel like the stripes on the one, the second one are a lot finer. I think I want to add a little more purple to these ones. They're going to dry. They're going to spend a little bit of time over there. These two are pretty much done. So we're going to do a little touch up of white on her shoe. And then we're going to start going over bases, um, which isn't interesting, but is necessary. So. So once I'm done with these, um, I'm going to work on the expansion. I'm going to, because uh, I'll probably finish Castagir early next week, uh, like early Saturday next week. I will finish Castagir. He'll be done. Um, and once he's done, that means that the base game is finished. Um, so once the base game is finished, I feel like it's just time to, to move on to the expansion. So we'll move on to the expansion. The expansion is um, 
another seven figures because it's a different time period for each of the figures from the base game. Um, there was one more figure that you could kickstart, but I don't believe it is currently available. It was another original figure. It wasn't like another canon character because what other char canon immortal was there in the only movie? Uh, there weren't. There weren't any other canon characters in the, in the movie. Uh, he doesn't need any more work. Yeah, he needs some touching up. Um, and that's fine. Um, I am a little bummed that I missed out on it, but it was already a kind of expensive Kickstarter, so like, well... I do wish that they had had um, the rights to the TV show. The TV show is where some of my favorite characters are. Uh, Sarah and I already started brainstorming um, what we would do for um, if we were going to do TV show characters in this game, like what powers we would give them and what additional cards we would add to the decks. Because the way this one works is that the characters are all, um, they each have a special ability and they each have stats and their stats are cunning, influence, and power. And you gain in those stats by, um, or you lose in those stats by living different types of lives. Because as is made clear, immortals don't just live like a single lifespan. They, they live long lives and they sort of play different roles throughout their lives. Uh, who Ramirez was when he was young is not who Ramirez is when we meet him. Uh, and that goes for basically all the immortals. Um, that's really interesting from a character perspective. And so from the game's perspective, you have different, um, different lives. So as you go through your life, you may have a life of training, for example. And you can see under here it has an I, a P, and a C. And the I, if you turn it sideways, it has a little minus. And the C has a minus, but the P has two pluses. That means that if you, um, it, your stats aren't like hard numbers, they are the dies, the dice that you roll. So you are rolling these. So if you have a six in power and a, an eight in cunning and a four in um, influence, you would be rolling a six for power when a, you have a power challenge. You'll be rolling an eight for cunning. You would be rolling a d4. If you live a life of training, you get to add that it slides under your um, character sheet and matches up with your stats, with the relevant stat. You would then be rolling a six for cunning because you have gone down one die. You would then be rolling a 10 for power. You cannot go lower than a d4 or higher than a d12 so you would go down, your four would stay the same. Um, and then you can have up to two of those cards. So let's say we had a life of training and a preacher's life. You can see the preacher's life didn't add anything for cunning or power, but it did even out my, influ my influence. Um, whereas say an easy life would cancel out those two and bring me down one for that. If you did that, you'd go down one power, up one cunning, up one influence. So depending on what cards you draw and choose to keep, you end up living different lives. You can also, instead of doing a life, you can go and have conflict. You can challenge NPCs, basically. Um, you can have events. This is the ambush event. Um, eventually, you're going to go to the arena and fight another immortal. That's where this deck comes in. And you basically roll power until um, 
and you get re-rolls for having quickening tokens and stuff. You basically r roll and roll and roll until you both, you know, are like, okay, I'm done re-rolling, um, done spending quickening tokens. We sort of house rolled it that you get to spend one to increase the die, and one to re-roll, um, but you don't get sort of infinite, <laughs> infinite spending quickening tokens. They're a limited resource anyway, but it's very easy to sort of s just burn right through them. Um, you want to be the one who flips the top card on the uh, on the challenge deck. And the reason you want to be the one to flip the top card is because when you turn it over, it'll say um, like something like, well, that was a rematch. But it'll say something like humiliate, choose an immortal in the arena. That immortal loses a quickening token. So you want to be the one to draw that card because you don't want someone else to be choosing you. Um, you don't want, uh, let's see. Ruin, give this to another immortal in the arena. Um, and that life is only discarded when you lose a, when you win a duel. It basically wipes out one of your lives because you can only have two life cards at a time. Um, choose an immortal in the arena, that immortal loses their weapon, you may gain it. So you want to be the one to flip these cards, not only for all of that, but because... And you'll see these all say, uh, discard this card, discard this card. You don't put these back in the deck. So this challenge deck is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually the only card left is this one. Behead. The immortal or immortals that rolled lowest in the duel are beheaded. That's it. Done. You're dead. Um, the way the game is played, you can that can be an immediate knockout. You can immediately get knocked out of the game for that. Um, or you can play uh, a variant of the game that is, is in the rule book. This is not a house variant of the game. This is a legitimate like official variant where if you get knocked out and there are still figures in the box, you can go and pick another character and jump them into the game. The idea being that there are always new immortals getting born, there are always new immortals coming in to, to challenge. So maybe it's just someone who was living in seclusion, maybe uh, they you know, only just showed up to the gathering. Um, so here they are. The variant on that variant that we kind of like to do, that we've done a, a couple of times, I think, uh, Sarah and I did it, and I think Andy and I, Andy, Sarah and I did it, um, is you start off playing the early timeline version of a character. So, you know, you could pick Connor McLeod of the Clan McLeod, and if you get knocked out as Connor, or, yeah, as you, if you get knocked out as Connor, you grab the expansion version and come back as Russell, Russell Nash. Um, you would start as Ixtalali, and if you get knocked out as Ixtalali, you come back in as Talia. And that's a fun, that, honestly, that was a really fun variant to play because your abilities are not the same from time period to time period. Um, so, yeah, I liked that. That was, that was a fun way to do it because you, you sort of had that uh, evolution of the character, which was cool. And with seven characters in the base game and seven more in the expansion, if you play that variant, you can definitely keep a game going for a little while. Um, when we played this on stream, John won. It came down to me and John um, at the end. And um, I don't even remember who we were playing <laughs> and like what characters we had. But I do remember that uh, it came down to the very end and the card that John played uh, made it so that we all lost, we both lost all of our quickening tokens. So at that point, there were no more rerolls. There was no changing your power die. That was it. That was all you had. And you just sort of had to hope you rolled higher and John rolled higher. And that was the end. And it was great. It, it, it felt like we were right down to the wire. It was super. It was a, a great flavorful sort of way to end the game, which was neat. So, um, so let's do, let's do Castigear here. We're going to do Sarah's and start doing some of those vertical stripes. I've got about 10-15 minutes 
before I want to uh, finish up. So, yeah. Because I have to go home um, for a couple of reasons. One, I want to pick up my computer so that I have it for tonight's stream. Uh, two, I need to spend some time with my cat. Three, uh, I need to feed the cat. <laughs> so those are, are some good reasons, I think, to go home. Um, so yeah, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, there's a lot of road work between me and home. It, it definitely made our commute getting here that much longer, which is super frustrating. Just ends up feeling like it takes forever for no good reason. Um, they've done something very foolish on one of the roads between here and home. Um, there's a left turn lane with a left turn arrow uh, at the lights, and it's at the top of a hill. And it's two lanes of traffic going straight, and then the left hand straight lane splits into another lane at the top of the hill. And it has space for maybe five or six cars, and um, that ha light has a left turn arrow. So, and then the left turn arrow turns off. Anyone who didn't make it stays there. People can keep going straight, no problem. And the oncoming traffic starts coming. Um, they've been doing construction on the other side of the road. Uh, they've been doing construction at a, a train station. And they've closed one of the two oncoming lanes. To make room, they have then closed that left turn lane so that they can have these two oncoming lanes because they've had to close one of those lanes um, most of the time. And in, you know, sometimes a day like midday, you only need one lane, but in the morning during rush hour, people are heading towards Boston. They want two lanes, so they close that left turn lane. The problem is then you, it, it, didn't, it doesn't stop people from needing to turn left <laughs> at the top of that hill, which means that out of those two lanes that normally go straight, one of them then fills up with people who are trying to turn left. But because there's no one sitting in that left turn lane, the left turn arrow does not trigger. And there's so much oncoming traffic, it's in, at the top of a hill that visibility is hard that if you're at the top of that hill, you cannot see. It, it's very difficult to tell who's coming, and there's a lot of oncoming traffic. And uh, turning left is almost impossible to do without that light. So you end up sitting there, but because you are then you then have all these people who are trying to turn left, they're blocking an entire lane, um, which is bad. So it's, it's ugly. It was a really ugly mess coming over here, and I foresee it being an ugly mess on my way home, and then another ugly mess coming back. So we're just going to have to hope for the best.
need to do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's getting very noisy downstairs because people are very excited about magic. And I don't think they realize that someone is streaming up here, which, I mean, why would they? But also, it's very noisy downstairs now because they've also decided to sit right under where I'm streaming. But I'm going to finish up soon. I'm going to finish the vertical stripes on this. Uh, figure, and then I'm going to finish up what I'm doing. off-white we're going to touch up a few places and then do the wide stripes and then I think I will call it a day I'm going to text Andy in case he's not listening um, I am a lot happier with how this looks than I was with um, how it looked before, like to a ridiculous degree. Yeah, we're doing the last little stripe here because his sleeves have a white band there and then he's got a white band, two white bands down his back. So we're going to do those and then we will be done for the day. I will um, 
see folks next time. We are streaming um, we're going to be streaming um, some magic tonight, not uh, Throne of Eldraine, but some absolute nonsense. Um, so yeah, that's the plan. I think I'm going to want to um, do a little bit of de more detail work on that, fill it in. Um, I think I will do a purple wash on it um, and get that in there, sort of direct it, because it's a little bit denser. But I'm really happy with how that's coming out. Uh, definitely more happy than I was with the original um, paint, job, paint job I had. Otherwise, uh, the base game is done uh, for Sarah's copy, and I'm pretty happy with it. I'm pleased with how it's coming out. Um, excuse me. And then next week, we'll work on the expansion, and maybe we will work a little bit on some Doctor Who, because I got those too. So, yeah, thank you for watching. I'm sorry I wasn't able to interact with the chat as much, um, but we will either see you later this evening for Magic Times at 7.30 Eastern, or I will see you next week on Saturday for more painting. Bye. Bye.